Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be back briefly. And I, I have to say that when I got the invitation to come and present here, then uh, uh, my instinct was that this is such a distinguished group of presenters that you know, you can come back even from Yale. <laughs> this definitely competes and in some respects even defeats uh, academic life, a very vibrant academic life over there. So um, I feel really privileged. Um, today I'm going to be talking about transnational populism from below. And I feel that this fits into this panel quite well, which was titled as Globalization and Populism. So uh, populism has been surging in many countries across the world to this extent that many authors claim that we can talk about a global surge of populism. And um, uh, as you heard from my introduction, uh, I've been working with transnational migration studies as well as with populism studies. So this presentation is in a way... Um, 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 let's say, a result of the intermarriage of, between those two disciplines. Um, as you have heard here before, uh, yesterday, um, about the different theories uh, which explain how populism has become so successful, I won't go in there to repeat them, but just to, you know, briefly outline them, then there is the economic explanation that a lot of people are becoming supporters of populists because uh, the economies have been stagnant, uh, they feel that they have been left out and they wish you know, somebody would come and correct it. Then there is the sociocultural explanation which, which says that people uh, simply feel this kind of a value-based contradiction with the liberal uh, paradigm and hence the populists get their vote. Uh, but I would say that uh, there are also some cases where um, these two theories definitely function but not fully, that there are still cases where uh, we can't really talk about the economic conflicts uh, to, to such an extent or the cultural kind of conflicts to such an extent. And I would outline a couple of paradoxes which have also been pointed out here earlier, um, uh, yesterday, for instance. So, for instance, why do the uh, tropes of migrants as welfare queens uh, fare well even in countries where the majority of migrants are labour migrants, like in the Central and Eastern Europe, as was pointed out by George Shufflin yesterday? Or why economic populism flourishes well also in Central and Eastern Europe, which hasn't really experienced this kind of economic stagnation as the United States has or as some countries in, in Western Europe have. Uh, or why indeed, as Tenovik pointed out yesterday, uh, there was a political party that was promising not to build a mosque to Tartu, which, well, basically does not have a Muslim population there. So these are, in a way, paradoxes, and I feel that the transnational explanation to the spread of populism might shed some light into this. First, let's start with definitions. What is transnationalism? Um, transnationalism is a paradigm which has kind of uh, fared well in different disciplines, from anthropology to international relations. And in all of these contexts, it refers to processes where we see border crossing, resources, streams, uh, remittances, etc. Um, uh, one example, um, a very, I think, simple uh, uh, explanation, or uh, we can't call it def the definition of transnationalism, comes from Thomas Feist. And basically, he says that transnationalism is the answer to the question why so few migrants from very many countries end up in the destination country, and so many migrants of very few countries end up in the destination country. So uh, if we take the example of Estonia, why do we have, uh, let's say, a lot of Ukrainians or Russians coming to Estonia, and, and let's say very few Uruguayans coming to Estonia or Ecuadorians? And the answer is that there aren't these kind of information networks, social networks, financial networks that people would actually find the way to Estonia from, uh, from Ecuador, for instance. Um, Luis Eduardo Cornicio and Michael Peter Smith have differentiated between uh, transnationalism from above and transnationalism from below. 
So these are different processes that actually uh, kind of uh, contribute to the same end, that they make some countries, some economies, some cultures more interconnected and others remain kind of less interconnected. So transnationalization from above happens thanks to transnational capital, thanks to transnational corporations establishing these kind of economic um, clusters across state borders. Uh, it happens thanks to global or transnational media, which uh, kind of covers events or streams them from one country to another. And it also happens thanks to supranational political institutions and cooperation. So, for instance, that we have the European Union or the European Parliament. This is also something that fosters transnationalization. But uh, Cornelia and Smith also argue that there is a transnationalization from below, which happens from the ground up, and where the main agents are migrants, uh, people who move across borders, and who hence also interconnect the different countries to one another. So, um, in a way, transnationalism is kind of an alternative explanation to globalization. When globalization says that the whole world is becoming interconnected, then transnationalism says that, not the whole world, but it just some particular countries or some particular transnational spaces. I would say that both of these uh, phenomena, both transnationalization from above and from below, uh, kind of foster the so-called global spread of populism, that the populists are learning from one another. Um, I would say that there are examples where we see that uh, the transnational media is kind of um, the, the source of the spread of so-called populist ideas from one country to another, uh, that Estonian parties are promising similar things that have been promised in Hungary, or that an Estonian politician, uh, when having, uh, having gotten a, a very good electoral result, said that we are going to do Trump in Estonia. So again, it's kind of a, uh, a movement of an idea, presumably through the media or that we have um, uh, political groups on the European Parliament level where the so-called populists who are very diverse but still aim to co cooperate. And I would also say that this is an arena where we have these interconnections, mutual learning from one another, etc. cetera. Um, and here is also an example. Uh, how many of you know who is Tommy Robinson? Can you show me your hands? One, two, three, four, and five, six out of 200 or something like that. So, um, and I, I can translate this uh, title is important. Tommy Robinson was freed from, from jail. Uh, Tommy Robinson is an activist in the UK and he was, um, he has been convicted before, uh, but this time he was released from jail after he had published a video on Facebook of people uh, in court who were tried for uh, sexual offenses. And he put this up on Facebook, even though the judges had said that you know, information should not flow out of this courtroom. Uh, and uh, the uh, radical right has kind of trumpeted him as um, uh, like a freedom fighter uh, for free speech, etc. Uh, and uh, kind of exposing the problems and internal corruption of the legal system, of the police, and so on. Um, most of you don't know anything about him, but he is a hero on Breitbart UK. Do you know what Breitbart is? More people do. All right. <laughs> and Breitbart is also an example of uh, transnationalization from above. It basically, it's part of the alt-right media in the US, but it has spread. It has its clusters abroad, but it also kind of spreads news into non-affiliated uh, outlets, as Objektiv is in Estonia. Um, yeah, but today I would like to focus more on transnational populism from below, or what is the agency of migrants uh, in the spread of populism. And I'm going to paste my uh, further talk on two articles. One of them is coming out in a book very soon, which is called Political Parties Abroad, and where we wrote a chapter about ECRES, this is the Estonian um, People's, sorry, uh, the Conservative People's Party of Estonia, uh, which is 
according to Kasmude, could be classified as a populist radical right-wing party and has a branch organization in, uh, in Finland. Um, the other article, yeah, sorry, I, I, <laughs> it doesn't really uh, show the name of, uh, of my co-authors, that's why I actually put it there, uh, is, um, I would call it a diverse case study, uh, which I'm co-authoring with um, Sebastiano Pérez de Reguero from the University of Diego Portales from Chile, and uh, uh, Ingeke Jena Rodenberg from the U University of Duisburg Essen in Germany, uh, which is looking at very diverse cases of what I would call transnational populism from below, namely the AKP party of Turkey, which is actively campaigning in Germany, but also in the Netherlands, for instance, where they have their uh, largest emigrant communities. The example of Mpais, uh, and well, there we are using basically the data from uh, the campaign of Rafael Correa, uh, who was the president of Ecuador, and how he campaigned in Spain. And then the example of Ekre, who is campaigning in Finland, which is the largest destination country for Estonian uh, contemporary migrants. Um, yeah, and here are a couple of examples. So here you see the um, flag of the AKP uh, party uh, uh, at the Brandenburg gates, I suppose. And uh, Estonians going to vote with an Ekre flag in, in Helsinki and uh, also the parliament of Ecuador, where they have a special representation for emigrants. So basically, Ecuadorians abroad can elect for their special representatives from Europe, Asia, uh, and Africa, uh, or the rest of, no, yeah, the rest of the world, uh, so to say. Um, I'm going to focus mainly on the case that I know best, but I can bring a few parallels with very different cases. And um, as been, has been said about populism, that you know, it's, it's a very fuzzy concept and we have very different populists across the world, I would say that the same is true about these three cases. We have AKP, uh, which I would allocate under authoritarian populism. We have ECRE, which could be classified as uh, a radical right-wing populism or right-wing populism, or as Muda and Kaltwasser say, exclusionary populism. And then we have Rafael Correa, who is a left-wing populist from Latin America. So uh, very different cases, but still with some internal parallels. Um, and here is a bit of background information, which is necessary to, in order to follow uh, uh, the uh, uh, next parts of the presentation about what political transnationalism from below looks like, or how migrants can engage in politics. Uh, and Eva Estergal Nielsen has kind of said that there are four ways. They are engaged in homeland politics, so they vote, for instance, back home or engage with, uh, with um, uh, some NGOs back home or finance parties, etc. They are part of immigrant politics, or they might have a vote or a say in their host country. They can also be part of diasporic politics. So a diaspora is a group of emigrants which basically comes, uh, becomes kind of a, a, a polity of closure in itself, that they might develop their own political institutions, their own tensions, etc. And they can also be part of translocal politics. So uh, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the nation states they're living in, but it might have something to do with the localities where they are. So for instance, Mexicans uh, have, uh, and many other uh, nationalities as well, have established hometown associations. So they might not be engaged on national level politics, but they're trying to support their home community or community of origin in, in some ways or the other. And uh, unlike most of the speakers so far, I am using the ideationalist approach to populism. And although I've been in the uh, strategic or discursive camp before, uh, when analyzing populism in, in the Baltic states, for instance, then I feel that the ideational approach kind of fits better in this case, because, well, ideationalists say that populism is the so-called thin-centered ideology. Uh, I very much accept the criticism uh, towards that, uh, but I feel that if we treat populism as an idea which is intermarried with transnationalism, then it becomes 
bigger than the sum of populism as a strategy and transnationalism as simply a location in the world. So uh, previous approaches to transnational populism have mostly been using this strategic way, but then it becomes kind of, um, transnationalism simply becomes an arena that there are parties which just function abroad and mobilize the masses, but it doesn't say anything about how do they incorporate transnationalism into the construction of the people, the antagonists, uh, or the heartland, which are the central concepts to the ideational approach. So the ideationalists say that populism is a thin-centered ideology, which says that there is the, the good, the moral people who, are, uh, who occupy the moral high ground, but who are oppressed by the corrupted uh, elites uh, who do not fo follow the right values anymore. Um, Right-wing populists or the exclusionary populists often also antagonize various minority groups who are other to the people. They might not be threatening to the people, but they are simply on the moral high ground. And I very much like the concept of heartland, which Paul Taggart has kind of popularized, uh, which uh, indicates uh, that there was this kind of a, um, let's say a nostalgic place where everything was still right, the right people ruled, the rules were right and righteous, authoritative, etc., until those morally corrupt elites came and kind of uh, messed everything up. Um, in my previous work, I have argued that uh, heartland is not necessarily just in the past. It can also lie in the future, that there is a future heartland, a time when, you know, everything will be right and righteous. Um, and uh, sometimes populists also construct something that we've called anti-heartland. So instead of talking about those good old times, they construct a narrative of a place where everything is wrong and use this to mobilize their supporters. So um, I would like to next answer to the question, can populists actually construct a uh, transnational people antagonism and heartland, or something that resonates transnationally. Earlier on, Ben Moffitt, who has written a very good essay on uh, transnational populism, has said that actually you cannot, because it's very difficult for, to find something that unites people across state borders. Uh, and hence, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit dubious whether we can actually see uh, transnational populism in, in action. For him, it's more of an int interesting academic category. I argue that, yes, you can see it in, in practice. So, um, exhibit number one. Um, this is an, is an excerpt uh, from an interview with um, uh, an ECRIS activist in Finland who describes basically what I would call the people. So, uh, this informant said that uh, ECRIS supporters are the people who have been chased away from Estonia. So, they are kind of forced migrants. They are the unwanted punch, the deplorables, so to say. So they are a part of the people who occupy the morally high, uh, moral high ground. They are the people with, uh, uh, who are highly educated, as, as inf the informant explains here, uh, etc. Uh, but still kind of repressed by the regime. And the people is transnational in this sense that those who have gone to Finland aren't different from the people back at home. Simply, those who went to Finland were the ones who were chased away, who decided to go away. The others were chased away too, but maybe they just decided not to leave. And here is a, yeah, a screenshot from uh, uh, Ekres uh, news sign, uh, where they had a banner uh, a couple of years ago which asked different questions, like do you want even higher taxes, many times lower wages, do you want to eat potato peels, Estonians know that it's not a delicacy, but it's something that people, desperate people eat. And they also asked about, do you want the continuation of economic deportation? So it's clear that they are using the narrative of forced emigration also amongst the people here in Estonia. And hence I would say that this is a transnational construction of people. Something very similar emerged in Ecuador, which has a very different type of populism, but there, uh, because a lot of the migrants left during the economic crisis in the 1990s, they use a very similar trope, that those are where the people that were chased away, 
And also they were the heroes because they helped to improve the Ecuadorian economy, not those bankers, the corrupt elite, but actually the, the good people who had gone abroad or who had, were chased away abroad. Um, there is also um, this kind of a um, uh, uh, anti-immigrant trope amongst uh, aircraft construction. Oh yeah, and as you can see from here, uh, there is a clear antagonist as well, as well, the cartel parties, the corrupt elites who chase the people away. In Ecuador, it's, it's the, uh, the, uh, the bankers as well, the financial elites. Uh, Turkey is a bit of a different case because uh, the AKP party was already in power when they were campaigning. Um, another antagonist, um, immigrants. And you can kind of rhetorically ask, can you actually sell anti-immigrant politics or Eurosceptic politics to people who are de facto migrants in, in Finland or free movers within Europe? The answer is yes, you can. And this has something to do with the anti-heartland construction that ECRA uses. So um, one of the party leaders uh, said in an interview that uh, the people in Finland are way more against immigration, well, the Estonians in Finland are way more against immigration than Estonians in Estonia because they see the situation where Estonia does not want to end up. And it's also a, a repeating trope about Finland being kind of an anti-heartland where people have gone over, uh, <laughs> over the board, oops, sorry, over the board with political correctness, with accepting immigrants and, you know, losing their own lifestyle, so to say. So Finland is, uh, in Ekres rhetoric, is not our big brother or the successful Nordic country, but rather the country who has serious problems and Estonia does not want to become like that. Um, uh, we cannot see this kind of uh, uh, rhetoric, obviously, in the case of Ecuador, because it's a left-wing party and a very inclusionary party. Um, but um, there is another other, for instance, for the AKP party, and these are the Kurds. So uh, they uh, appeal to the, uh, the Turkish-speaking uh, real Turks and kind of antagonize the Kurds. And this, again, plays to another conflict in the uh, country of destination. So uh, whereas amongst the Turkish population, for instance in Germany, the um, uh, economic migrants dominate. And amongst the Kurds, there are more political immigrants. So this also plays to the kind of opposition within the diaspora community. And they are trying to uh, export the antagonism in the homeland also to the host country, quite successfully, I would say. So, can populists actually construct people, antagonisms at heartland that resonate transnationally? Yes, they can. The people are the hardworking, good people who have been oppressed by the ruling elites in their homeland and who have been forced to go away. And in, in, in the case of right-wing populists, they are also endangered by the bad immigrants or minorities, uh, both in the host and potentially also in their uh, home country. Now, a question. Can homeland populism also uh, spill over to immigrant populism? Can people who vote for populists in their home country also start voting in this way in their host country? Um, and here we have many uh, kind of some um, restrictions, I would say. Uh, many migrants often back, uh, lack voting rights. So if you're not a dual citizen, you can't actually equally participate in both polities. Uh, they uh, might be less informed about uh, uh, domestic politics in host country because the process of migration is quite a stressful process and it's very difficult to keep track of you know, politics in different countries, deal with the stress of migration, etc. And uh, amongst some migrants there is also a certain sense of alienation. Um, in the interviews that we did with Estonians who had gone abroad some 10 years ago, uh, there was this kind of sense of alienation, they felt that they are not entitled to vote. They don't, are not entitled to actually speak about what should be in Finland nor in Estonia because they have left. But I would say that ECRA's rhetoric is a, a kind of a brilliant tool of emancipation. It's, uh, it's uh, kind of giving people back the interest in politics and the will and the want to speak in, uh, about politics, so to say. So uh, many ECRA's uh, uh, activists we interviewed uh, said that they feel that they no longer have to hide who they are. 
that they can come out of the closet. If they don't like uh, pe dark-skinned people, they can say so, especially if they speak in Estonian, so nobody in Finland kind of understands that. Um, uh, and they have become more active on social media, so it kind of functions as a training camp. And there is this kind of growth of political awareness thanks to this. What's interesting, though, is that there are uh, many ECRA activists who wanted to campaign for the true Finns, which is, which is a, well, ECRA's analog in Finland, also a, a relatively radical right-wing populist party, which is also anti-immigrant. But now you have this issue that Estonians are migrants in Finland as well, and uh, the true Finns have also said that they would like Estonians out of the country. So what do you do? And there is a rationalization. So uh, when these activists confronted this kind of criticism, they said that, yes, I will go. If the true Finns come to power, this is their land, this is their right, I will leave. But only if the true Finns come to power. If it's some corrupt things, then they can be part of the resistance, part of the populist resistance, also in Finland. So no, no contradiction there. So. Can homeland populism spill over into immigrant populism? Yes, it can. Because populist politics helps to activate politically alienated groups. It provokes to reconcile one's identities. But of course, there are restrictions because of the lacking rights or resources uh, amongst migrants. Finally, can transnational populism from below have a spillover to transnational populism from above? Can the fact that ECRA has a branch organization in Finland make ECRA and the True Finns, you know, more close cooperation partners. Well, here I have to come out with some no's. Well, uh, you might imagine that the True Finns weren't too happy about some, you know, some uh, immigrants uh, campaigning for them uh, in Finland, uh, which kind of might corrupt their position as this anti-immigrant party. Um, but they have established some kind of like cultural courting events. And there is parallel cooperation, very good cooperation on the European Parliament level. So um, these two things can run in parallel, even if they don't empower, empower one another as successfully. We see more successful examples uh, uh, with the AKP party, which has been, uh, which is supporting a, a Muslim party in the Netherlands, for instance, which has made it into the parliament uh, a lot, thanks to the Turkish votes. We see this kind of uh, flow of support also in the case of Germany in some local elections. And there is also this kind of interesting cleavage emerging that Die Linke in uh, Germany is becoming more of a Kurdish, uh, left-wing party, and the Social Democrats are more of a Turkish uh, left-wing party. So you have these kind of cleavages uh, emerging. But what can happen, or where we have these minor spillovers, are that migrants are part of this translation machine that helps ideas spread from one country to another. So uh, there are a, a few active correspondents who are uh, writing into Estonian alt-right media about how awful it is in Finland, how awful it is in, uh, in uh, Sweden, uh, etc. And they are kind of mediating stories from the alt-right media in those countries. In many cases also kind of uh, impartial reporting from the public broadcasters in those countries just to show that Estonia is not talking about the problems that the anti-heartlands are facing. So, can transnational populism from below also have a spillover to transnational populism from above? I would say no, at least not for the populist radical right, uh, because of the conflicting people and antagonist narratives, as in the case of ECRA and True Finns. But they can still function quite well in parallel streams, and migrants can function as translators. So, what to conclude? Uh, I would say that this is a very relevant phenomenon, even if it hasn't been kind of... Um, covered academically yet, so we are putting our efforts into doing that. Um, and it's relevant both on the left and the right. Um, transnational populism can be of critical importance, especially in emigration contexts, especially in immigration countries where people feel that they have been forced to go. Uh, it might not work as well with uh, in, in Belgium or France, where the majority of emigrants are quite well off, uh, highly educated, and these cosmopolitan free movers. 
Um, transnational populism from above and below often run in parallel, but they might not intersect. But uh, we will live to see what comes of the importance of uh, uh, pop transnational populism in immigration contexts. As I noted, there is already the example of AKP support in Germany and the Netherlands. Uh, there are some media reports about this phenomenon in the US, where I'm currently based, uh, but in the US we can't really see that this is a relative, relevant phenomenon yet. But this is where I stop. Thank you very much.